Welcome back. And I have my two experts with me in studio as we discuss domestic violence. Dr. Kizzy Shako, she's the SGBV forensic advisor uh, to the Chief Justice, as well as Margaret Njihia, who is a clinical psychologist. We'll be speaking to them in just a few. But first, we have a feature to get to. Domestic violence, also called intimate partner violence, is no doubt a global public health problem. The World Health Organization, or WHO, estimates that almost one third of women experience some form of physical and or sexual violence from an intimate partner in their lifetime. In Kenya, according to the most recent national data, which was back in 2014, about 41% of women reported having experienced physical or sexual violence from their husbands or partners in their lifetime. About two-fifths of those women reported physical injuries from the violence. Now, October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and tonight we share the story of a woman who left her abusive husband many years ago and started a new life abroad and is now sharing her story to free other victims from their lives of bondage. Take a look. My daughter is sick, I need to know. I'm telling you the truth. Do you understand that I need to know what's happening to my daughter? The sound of a domestic dispute. Don't even try. Do not even try. Okay, okay. This is actual footage of a fight ensuing between Shiro and her ex-husband. Though this is nearly a decade ago, his voice, his presence, his threats still haunt her. Shiro tells us the abuse started since the beginning of their marriage with verbal insults, then escalating to her ex-husband isolating her from friends and family. I want to say three years into the relationship, it had already started being physical. It started with poking, you know, like, po like a baby, you know. <laughs> the way you see kids, small kids fighting and poking each other. And then it went to a slap, then a punch, then it went to full-blown war. That war landed her in hospital with severe injuries. It was the moment, Shiro says, was her breaking point. I went through uh, different surgeries, stomach, my leg, my eardrums were busted. Um, so that's how bad it got. I almost literally died. The abuse even extended to her businesses and anyone associated with her. He was using the police to intimidate me. I could not walk in the streets of Nairobi without looking over my shoulder. I had police stopping me for no reason. I had my employees being arrested for no reason. Now, anyone who was associated with me started being in trouble with the police. Like many domestic violence survivors, Shiro didn't have many people to turn to. So the question was, Shiro, um, are your kids in school? Yeah. What school do they go to? I tell them the name of the school. They are like, whoa, expensive school, right? Shiro, do you have food in the fridge? Do you ever go hungry? No. Do you take matatu or boda boda? Oh, you drive a BMW? Ah. So those were the kind of things that I was being told. Like, you have a business, you're living a good life, you live in this big two-story house. So they were looking at the material things. And they were telling me that, you know how many people envy you out there? So imagine if you went to every single person who you thought would give you advice and they, told, they tell you, stay. She knew, however, what staying meant. And so she took a leap of faith and fled the country, eventually seeking asylum abroad. I had $45 between me and poverty when I reached. So I stayed at, the, at a shelter homeless people shelter for three months. And then, so I started life from there. I got, a, uh, I got accepted as an asylum, I was given documentation, I got a work permit, I moved out of the shelter. I stayed in, the, um, in a one room basement apartment for like a year. Got a good job, started my life from there. And then things started to shift for her. I started an organization called Pendo International Projects that does early childhood education. So. 
I bought land, built a new school in, uh, in the outskirts of Nairobi and um, started advocating for refugees, women and kids. And I've done so many things um, from there, including winning awards uh, for the work that I've been doing. And I've been traveling all over the world, uh, just advocating. Sharing her story now with courage is what keeps Shiro going. Though she admits the healing journey was not without its challenges having to go through five years of therapy. Like I cut out everyone for three years, just focused on rebuilding my life. And for me, it was easier to do this in a new country where no one knows me, no one is going to judge me. I won't pass by and someone will, you know, someone will start talking about me, you know, because we are humans and we still really care about our reputation. But really, cut away anyone who is taking you back from there. But really focus on, even if you don't forget, forgiveness. For me, I can tell you I've forgiven my ex and anyone else who helped him. Anyone else who helped me, him to try and destroy me. Her only advice to victims in similar situations is this. Walk away. That's all I can say. Advice that saved her life and she hopes will see others take their own brave steps to a life of freedom. All right, so let me get your initial reactions. Uh, Margaret, let me begin with you because I'm so sure you encounter several clients like Shiro. But what are your initial thoughts to her story? Um, thank you so much for having me on set. I think I like and I love the fact that she walked away. Hmm. Uh, it takes so much courage uh, from those that I have met in similar circumstances to walk away. Uh, her story resonates with very, very many other women in similar circumstances. Uh, and GBV is not a respecter of position. It's not a respecter of socioeconomic status. Mm. It's not a respecter of race or those other attributes that we think about. And it's so characteristic that the people around you, especially if you seem to be living in a certain uh, class, mm -hmm. Uh, they will tell you exactly what they tell. They told her, stay, right. because the state has. And then also we have uh, some family members who feel like, so if you walk away, the benefits you are getting, the financial support and the class uh, you've uplifted us as a family, how are we going to deal with that? And, and for me, that is one brave woman. And there are not many of them, there are few of them. And I always say this, if, if it breaks you, it's not love, hmm. it's toxic love. And we need to learn to differentiate between what love is and what toxic love is. Speaking of which, um, before I bring you in, Dr. Shako, you know, what are the forms of abuse out there? Because some people may not be able to know, oh, this is actually a problem. There, there are some that are very subtle, mm -hmm. uh, extremely subtle that uh, it also takes you a while to realize what is going on. And before anything gets physical, it started emotionally. Uh, then you have someone, it's psychological, someone is banging a door, dropping something, uh, you're driving and someone swerves the car in a way that is meant to, you know, scare you. Uh, they raised their voice in a way that you didn't expect and you hadn't seen that. And because it's not addressed at that time, then it escalates. By the time someone is slapping you, they've emotionally beaten you, they've psychologically abused you. They've even gotten to the point where they have socially isolated you. We talk about financial uh, abuse because mm -hmm. it's there. They, are, they, they don't want you to work some of them, they are also denying uh, provision and taking care of you financially. They want to cut you off from your social support. And you know, they don't even want you to participate in family right. meetings and family gatherings and all those are different forms of abuse. But by the time it gets to someone has slapped you, that just didn't start then. It started a while ago and it has taken a while even for you to realize that mm -hmm. I'm actually living in a very toxic and abusive environment. Right, it's a slow escalation. And Dr. Shako, you came across several victims who, let's be honest, probably came at the extreme. 
right? It wasn't at the emotional abuse stage. Uh -huh. But when it comes to reporting, where does one even begin? Okay, so thank you for having me here. Um, I just, if I can comment on the video you, yeah. you played, um, I like that she says the best advice I can give is you leave. And that she even gives the, you know, the escalation. It started like this and became like this and got to this mm -hmm. and I almost died. And it, you know, many people don't see it that way. So it's good when they can hear it from someone who survived it and is actually thriving. We need more stories like this. Um, as for how do we report and where do we report? So. Reporting should be, first of all, let's talk about pres preserving yeah. information. Um, many times, um, many of the victims I would see would come after the third, fourth, fifth beating. Or um, it's the first time they're reporting after several times and they didn't report any of the others. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I think uh, survivors need to know is that you should report this, you should get to a hospital immediately. Immediately it's safe to, of course not when it has just happened because he won't let you and you'll probably provoke the abuser, but you need to get to a hospital as soon as possible. Yeah. Avoid showering, avoid changing, avoid cleaning up, avoid all that. If you can just find a way to cover cover it so that you, it can be seen when you get to the medical examination room for documentation purposes. Right. That in itself acts as a record that something has happened, something serious enough for this person to decide to act on, um, something that actually has injuries visible, you know, we can see the, the, the clothes and everything, those need to be documented. And then with that, one can then decide whether to proceed with legal action or not. Um, it's always best to proceed so that even the next step would be going to the police station. Mm. Um, at the police station, um, that's where now you report uh, and it will initiate an investigation. So at the police station, you go with your medical report from the medical facility. Right. Um, they will document, give you an occurrence book number. It's very important that you get that number. Please don't live without it. Mm. <laughs> Absolutely don't live without it. And then they will issue a P3 form or a Kenya police medical report form. That form is a police paralegal document. They have to have it for investigations. Then you need to go back to a medical facility, preferably a government facility, that will then indicate the kind of injuries that they found, the status of the clothes, even maybe the mental status at the time. And then that needs to be returned to the police station again, and it goes into the police file. Um, and uh, after they've investigated, that will be presented to the ODPP. However, because we are talking about domestic violence, safety is so critical here. You can't just go report and then he's arrested and then you're in the same house. So it's important to have a safety net. So many times I advise after the first medical report, you need to sit with a psychologist and, and kind of plan an exit strategy. That is really critical to your survival. Because um, reporting while you're still in the same home, that's, that's like a, it's not advisable. You need to know where you're going first, where you're exiting to first. You need shelter, you need safety. Yeah. If there are children, where are they going to? Because you can't leave your kids. Exactly. <laughs> Please don't leave your children behind. Yeah, and I would like to know how Shiro did that. It would be good to know a bit more about it. No, absolutely. And before I come to you, um, you know, Margaret, in terms of the psychosocial support that exists, you know, Dr. Shako, you talked about a process that sounds really seamless, but the reality <laughs> is, we have oftentimes officers that are insensitive to what the victims are going through. Victims mm -hmm. feel, I can't give full details because I'm going to be further victimized yes. or um, ostracized because of what I went through. So has it gotten better in terms of reporting? Have we had more humane uh, treatment of victims? Well, um, I would like to answer that with research to back up yeah. my answer, but I don't have that. Okay. However, this is an, a re-traumatization and re-victimization of survivors is now very well known yeah. by all the different um, ministries and sectors that are involved. So that's the medical sector, police, prosecution, judiciary. And you can see there's a lot of activities going on in these different spaces to bring about a change, to bring about reforms in the manner in which we treat or provide services to survivors, given that they're already traumatized. Yeah. So what is the trauma-informed, sensitive manner in which we should provide our services? So whether it's changed right now, I'm not sure, but it is work that is ongoing, especially through the National Council Council on the Administration of Justice and then the different sectors doing things in their own spaces. So like the judiciary has come up with
with the SGBV court, which is um, one of the principles is that we will not re-victimize anybody. Okay. Yeah, so there's work, it's work in progress. No, certainly. And, you know, Margaret, when we talk about now a victim who probably has gone through the whole process that Dr. Shako has explained is looking for shelter, you know, um, where can they go in a practical sense? Do we have safe houses that exist? I think that's a very interesting uh, conversation here because we need to start by first asking ourselves, um, whose responsibility is it? Mm to provide the shelter, to provide even the psychosocial support that we are talking about. Is it the different private partners? Is it the government responsibilities in the national government or is it the local government responsibility? Mm. But even before we talk about the shelter, let's go back to just a step behind what Dr. Shako is talking about here. So. This, there are so many people that uh, this survivor is reporting to. Right. And as they're transitioning through this whole process, so there's the first person that, of course, they told that they've been abused. Then they probably went to the police station the first time, the uh, gender desk, they went to the hospital, then they eventually met the prosecutor, eventually went to court, and then there's the final step of where we are taking them, whether they are being reintegrated back or they are going to a shelter or wherever. I think one of the things we need to uh, find a way of making sure that it's done in a safe way yeah. is just how many people is this survivor going to see hmm. and to repeat their story? Right. Is there a way that, you know, at the first contact point, we can collect as much information as possible? I don't have to keep telling every other person the same story. It's GBV, it's SGBV, it comes with a sense of shame. Yeah. Uh, there's still a bit of stigma associated with it. And we need to protect the dignity of the survivor. We need to keep them in a space where they, they have a right to privacy. Mm. But how many people are we exposing them to? Yeah. So maybe we need to find a way of collating all the different forms that are there that they have to fill in and just have one that you know, maybe the police and the doctor by then they can, they will have collected enough information yeah. and then also make sure that we are not waiting for the end of the five steps in order to initiate help. That at the first contact point, then psychological help starts there mm -hmm. and the whole spectrum of the psychosocial support starts there because it's not just therapy. Yeah. It's not just about the emotional need. They need shelter, like we are talking right. about. Mm -hmm. They probably need continued medical care. They have children. Where are they going to go? So at what point then we need to ask ourselves, at what point is the beginning point for the psychosocial support that Victoria we are talking about? Yeah. It's a conversation we need to right. have. Having said that, there are different uh, organizations at different levels that do that and all of them are offering different kinds of support. Uh, if you look at Red Cross, they have the P PFA, the Psychological First Aid, MSF, they have what they are offering. The Nairobi Women, they have what they are offering. Then we have the private individuals and entities that are running uh, the rescue centers that are there. Right. But it's so fragmented that you don't even know who is doing what and up to what extent. And I think it's time we have a conversation and look at what are you doing? We need to look at the quality of help right. that each one of them is giving. Because if we are talking about helping this individual, it's holistic help. So if one is just doing psychological first aid, if another one is just doing shelter, and another one is just doing maybe economic empowerment, and I don't know who else is doing what, um, at what point is this person going to move from this place to the next one and to the next one and to the next one who facilitates all this movement yeah yet they need that help because uh, they're all working in silos i have to bring bring this up um dr shako because i'm seeing the men complaining online saying look women are not the only victims and we know that women are the majority the but they're also male majority. victims and even when it comes to how men report um, they also need to feel safe enough to be able to come exactly. out to talk about um, the issues that they're encountering. How is that being made 
um, conducive, at least for them, from a legal perspective, also from reporting the police? Well, you know, there's no, um, no one is saying that men are not victims at home as well. There are men, and like you said rightly, it's, the issue is that most victims are women, yeah? And, you know, whether it's a male, a female, child, everyone is, 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 is open to getting the same services. Yeah. And I think because of the raised awareness in terms of male, uh, male victimization as well, um, all the service providers are aware that even men can come for help mm. and it's okay. We, they, we're not supposed to stigmatize them any further. So I would encourage them to seek these services and not expect to be stigmatized because of it or mocked because they are men. Um, just try. And if you have an issue with it, please get psychotherapy. Let's look for a psychologist who can help you walk through this journey. They, are really, they really come in handy when it comes to supporting you to report and to get the help you need. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, lastly, Margaret, before I let you go, because mm -hmm. I'm thinking about Shiro's story, mm -hmm. right? She was able to heal, rebuild, because she was outside of the ecosystem where she had faced that abuse, right? She <laughs> moved entire countries. That's not the case for a lot of people. You know, you're having to maybe move a county, <laughs> and, you know, and people still know probably where you are and your story, and the shame still moves with mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. So how practical is it that someone can still heal given those circumstances? When I speak as a psychologist, it's practical, you can heal. But that healing, it's, it's a continuum. Yeah. So it doesn't start and end here. It's a continuum through, throughout, throughout. It's looking at all the different uh, forms of support that you need. But for that healing to even take place, we two critical things uh, to pay attention to. Number one, the support system of the survivor, whether irrespective of the gender. Mm and irrespective of the, uh, of the age, the support system is extremely critical and all of them do need a good backup of people who are going to be there with them and who are going to work with them. Yeah. Of course, it talks about it also for the healing to take place, then there are changes and there are adjustments to be made. So what does this individual need? What are their needs? And we don't have a blanket kind of uh, program or structure for everyone or plan. Right. It's individualized because every one of them have their own unique needs. So the change of environment may be okay or maybe facilitate mm -hmm. and help but on the other hand are we moving this person from a place where we are taking them where they don't even have support system and even exacerbating the situation that such that now their needs are even more grave than they were so you look at each case uh, on its own merit you come up with a psychosocial plan that is unique to the person taking care of their unique needs yeah. but overall they do heal but that healing has to be holistic support. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Shako mm -hmm. and Margaret, for coming in and shedding more light on this issue. Um, and of course, this is just the beginning of starting that conversation. Hopefully it continues in uh, the various spheres of society. Let's take a short break. Much more ahead. Stay with us.